Say you've just boarded an airplane. When you board an aircraft, you put your safety in the hands of those who've effectively trained their lives to fly the machine you just stepped onto. It's a lot of responsibility for someone to take on. If something goes wrong, potentially hundreds of people are dependent on the pilot to take them to safety, and in extreme cases, save their lives. Trans Colorado Flight 2286 is a case of two pilots sat in the flight deck of a plane who by the end of this video, you may arrive at the conclusion that they probably had no business being on the flight deck on that one specific night in 1988. But not to poison the well too much, let's break down some preliminary information. Trans Colorado Airlines was a regional airline that operated out of Denver throughout the 1980s. They were one of those franchise airlines and operated their planes under the Continental Airlines brand as Continental Express. Their fleet of planes consisted of just a handful of propeller aircraft, namely the Convair 580 and their most plentiful plane, a small turboprop called a Metroliner. The Fairchild Metroliner is a tiny, two abreast commuter plane with a capacity of just 19 passengers. For very short regional routes, especially to serve some of those hard to reach communities across terrain featured in such places as Colorado, the plane proved useful. It was made small enough that airlines could operate it without a flight attendant. Small planes such as this one at the time also didn't require flight recorders or a ground proximity warning system. Some have argued that this plane justified its existence as a commercial passenger plane to allow operators to circumvent certain rules to save money. The Axton plane never carried either a cockpit voice recorder or flight data recorder, which made the subsequent investigation all the more difficult. On the day of January 19th, 1988, this Metroliner, which was acquired by the preceding regional airline Pioneer Airlines, was working a normal day of operations out of Denver's Stapleton Airport. As a side note, Stapleton Airport was closed in the 1990s, and the area has now been redeveloped into a suburb. That day, a crew of two pilots would take the small aircraft on a number of flights. 36-year-old Captain Stephen Silva and 42-year-old First Officer Ralph Harvey had been flying the aircraft all day. Their journey began in Denver. They made two flights in and around Wyoming before their return back to Stapleton. Their fourth, and the Axton flight, was another regional hop to Durango in southwest Colorado. Captain Silva was a very proficient pilot on the Metroliner. He had spent most of his flying career up to that point flying them, with a little over 3,000 hours logged in the type, and a further 1,000 on top of that. First Officer Harvey was still somewhat new to the plane, having only logged 305 hours in the Metroliner. In total though, one could look at his total flight hours of 8,500 and assume he was a competent pilot. We'll be returning to the records of both of these pilots later in this video. By the time the flight to Durango came around, the pilots were running behind schedule due to poor weather in the region. It was winter and light snowfall was recorded in the area. At 20 past 6 in the evening, Trans Colorado Flight 2286 left Denver heading southwest for the 72 minute flight to Durango. It was the first officer who was handling the flight controls on this particular leg. Most of the flight was uneventful, so we should focus our analysis on the approach phase of the flight. Durango Airport is not only very small, but also falls within a particular type of airport that doesn't even have a control tower. Instead, Flight 2286 was in communication with a controller in Denver who would clear them onto their approach. Durango is also a town that is tucked away, secluded by the Rockies mountain range. During the day, this short flight would provide impressive views. At night though, the mountain tops were shrouded in the veil of darkness. The weather at Durango on the night of the accident was poor. The cloud base was just 800 feet above the ground and visibility was reduced down to just one mile. The winds were calm, but there was light snowfall. And of course, it was fogged in. At no point would either of the two pilots initiate a missed approach. To make up for lost time in their delays, the pilots elected to fly a straightened approach from the north. 
It would save them several minutes instead of flying around the airport to the other side, which was what was normally preferred, due to the instrument capabilities on that end. The straighten approach was a greater workload. It demanded a step-down procedure to avoid terrain. Of course, there are mountains in this region, but they trend downward in height on the northern approach to Durango. The decreasing height in mountain peaks trend into a hilly region before planes reach the runaway, so these steps are important for terrain avoidance. Especially so in this case given Flight 2286 was flying at night without terrain awareness installed on the plane. When investigators looked over the data that was available for this flight, the lack of a flight data recorder, meaning that ATC recordings and data pinged from the plane's transponder, were key in plotting the altitude data for the plane's descent. What they found was that Flight 2286 descended much faster than normal, even to make in the straight approach. The descent was steep. Inadvertently, the small plane had dropped below the peak of the hills around five miles from the airport. A very precarious situation had unfolded, and of course, we now need to think about the obvious questions as to why the pilots never noticed this. To begin with, let's look at the pilot flying, First Officer Ralph Harvey. He had been a pilot for a number of years, however, his skill as a pilot was brought into question as it was revealed that he consistently failed progress and proficiency exams. He was even dismissed from a previous job for failing the exam to upgrade to a captain. Though he was said to be a likeable person and got along well with his co-workers, his piloting skills were described as mediocre. It is believed that the more difficult approach that evening in snowy winter weather was perhaps a lot for him to handle, which is why the pilot monitoring, in this case the captain, was there to step in if needed. But more on that in just a minute. When his first officer descended below the target altitude, he should have stepped in, but didn't. So now, we must direct our attention to the captain. Talking about Captain Stephen Silva is where the real twist comes into play. He himself was also not a pilot with a spotless record. He was involved in an accident involving a small Cessna in 1983. As the pilot in the accident, he landed on the wrong runway, failed to compensate for wind, misjudged distance and delayed a go around. Following re-examination, he was allowed to continue flying. As with many investigations, it was key for investigators to piece together the previous days of events, to track how the crew rested and performed on recent journeys. Captain Silva was resting the previous day. He visited relatives in the evening and went home and spent the night with his fiancée. This woman made a shocking admission to another pilot after the accident who then came forward to investigators with new information. She admitted that the two of them stayed up all night snorting cocaine. She denied the allegation at first and even threatened litigation for the claim. However, further tests carried out on the captain's blood revealed that yes, cocaine was present in his body at the time of the crash. Captain Silver, the night before the accident, got high on cocaine, slept very little, and thought it was a good idea to fly a plane, and he turned up for work anyway, and even performed three flights before the accident. By the time the flight to Durango came around, he was not only tired, but was also feeling the effects of cocaine withdrawal. At one critical moment as flight 2286 was on final approach into Durango, the pilot flying was overwhelmed with a difficult approach in very poor weather while the captain was too out of it to notice. It was as if the pilots had no idea what altitude the plane was at, how fast they were descending, or even just where they were. Because there were no flight recorders on the plane, we don't know for sure what happened in those final moments before disaster. Surviving passengers did note that the plane's nose did pitch up in the final moments before impact. Perhaps the pilots suddenly realized their mistake as the landing lights would have lit up the ground or trees or other vegetation that came into view. Either way, Flight 2286 flew into the tops of trees on one hill before crashing at the bottom of the hill ahead, where it rolled over, spun around, and skidded to a rest with the nose of the plane facing down the hill. Of the 17 people on board, 9 were killed, including the two pilots. 
Though controllers attempted to contact the plane, they received no response. The plane had crashed onto the snow-covered hills. The surviving passengers were lost, until a group of them set off to find help. The news of a pilot using cocaine made headlines all over the United States. Drug testing became common for pilots, and cocaine use by a pilot has never played a role in a plane crash since. New regulations came into force that made all commercial passenger planes, regardless of size, carry flight recorders and a ground proximity warning system. Flight 2286 is a case where the presence of such technology would have saved lives. Trans-Colorado Airlines was already deep in financial problems when the accident occurred. In the following months, things only deteriorated at the airline. Bankruptcy was declared in April of 1988, and they surrendered their operating license in July that same year. Hello everyone, I hope you are all well. I have not been, unfortunately, I've had a nasty cough, which carried into the production of this video, which is why I sounded a bit different in this one, but I am getting better and I'm hoping to be well for next week because I've been writing up next week's video these past couple of days and the accent we're going to be looking at next week involves a very unusual flight. It was quite a messy situation that needed unpacking and laying out, also an accident that you've likely never heard of before, so I'm looking forward to sharing that with you when it comes out. Anyway, I'm going to take a moment to thank my patrons over on Patreon for their amazing support. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now, so if you do see your name here, a massive thanks to you. A shout out this week to Mr. Giants, who pledged last week. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. If you yourself want to support the channel further, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content, two days before it goes out publicly on YouTube. If you are a patron and you want to connect with me or ask me questions or just want to chat, feel free to shoot me a message on there. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. That is where I'm going to end things for this video. If you want to follow my personal Twitter page, that too will be linked in the pinned comment. But in the meantime, thanks for sticking around and I will see you next week. Goodbye.